Bruce Gordon, welcome to The Mentor, mate. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, surprised to be here and honoured and everything else rolled into one. I actually wanted to thank you too, by the way, and we'll talk about it later, but for doing and uh, being part of the YouTube series, uh, Survive and Thrive, uh, your stuff's really interesting. And, uh, and one of the things I want to dig into is uh, more about you and what you do and what your industry does and uh, how you're performing, you know, within your industry, you know, and, uh, and I guess I want to revisit things like uh, some of the conversations you and I had in the uh, YouTube series. Um, I think you were episode one, uh, you know, whether or not any of those things worked. But let's just talk about um, Reese Gordon. How did you get involved in the tattoo game? Well, I was hanging around. I was a little bogan, hanging out with all the guys down the local shop. There's guys older than us driving GT Falcons, Tiranas, tattoos, mullets, listening to ACDC. I was just captivated. Age? Yeah, I was young. I was at 14, 13, 14, hanging around with 17, 18-year-olds. So I was like, wow, this is this is awesome. And I remember prior to that thinking from about 12, I don't want a normal life. So somehow tattooing came along. I was pretty good at artwork. And then I remember going to a tattoo shop at around 15 and just being blown away. The smell of dead old, a big airbrush dragon on the front door, uh, you know, music playing, probably cold chisel, or rose tattoo, just knock about people in there and just exciting. 15? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty that's I probably normal. looked 11. Well, that's not normal. I mean, that's you yeah. know, pretty unusual. I mean, I grew up in uh, Lakemba. Even you know, my cohort of people didn't really do that. Um, where are we talking about? Uh, uh, Melbourne, northern suburbs. Um, I spent a lot of time at a suburb called Mill Park, which is like a new housing estate. Um, so, you know, we used to, I used to ride dirt bikes from 11 years old in the paddocks out the back, you know, go to the blue light disco, all the usual, to me, what was a normal upbringing, suburban upbringing on the outskirts. We're talking a little bit on the edge. I mean, are we talking like, you know, you're a bad kid or like or we're both getting stabbed or shit like that or are we no. just talking about a normal kid? I, I think I'm, my view on myself is I'm normal. But if I look back now, probably not. People that were around me, um, you know, later on in life, my best mate in my teenage years, he ended up going on and kneecapping someone. You know, I, um, I've worked for people that have done time for manslaughter or armed robbery all this sort of stuff. But to me, they were just good knockabout people and that's what I did. Like I had a good upbringing. My family wasn't involved in crime or anything like that. But I think from the area I, I was in and hanging out with the, the bad crowd, which for me was adventure and exciting, um, it sort of went from there somehow. For me, everything was an adventure too. I never thought of um, where I grew up as a violent place. Um, it probably is when I think about it. It was. Um, probably still is today. Definitely still is today. Um, I never thought of myself as a violent person either, but I guess, you know, that sort of stuff happened with me and around me and to me sometimes. Um, but it was an adventure. That's a good way of putting it, actually. It was an yeah. adventure. Why was it exciting? What, what, did, what did it do to you? Hard to say, like... And I've thought about this over over the over the years, things like that. Like the pivotal moments for me are around 12 years of age going, I don't want a normal life. Why? I can't answer that. Um, you know, hanging around the local uh, group of shops or whatever, there's a guy down the road in a, a Brock Commodore. He'd drive past, we'd yell out to him, he'd do donuts for us and burnouts. That was fun and exciting. Probably growing up in a new housing estate, there's fuck all to do. Mm. So adventure was maybe hanging out with the rat bags, maybe, you know, riding your dirt bike on the road, you know, doing burnouts on people's front lawns, that sort of thing. I don't know, but I just remember always, yeah, and, and thinking as well, I don't want to stay here. I want to do something more and get out. And I think tattooing coming along maybe presented me that option or gave me that, adventure that then later on gave me an opportunity to go and live and travel overseas that maybe might not have happened if I'd stayed there and become a, a carpenter or a plumber. Which, by the way, probably a lot, a lot of your mates did. Yeah. It was the same as me growing up. Is tattooing 
and the images is it some sort of a little bit mystical and a, is it like, I mean how would you describe it yeah for sure back then it was definitely a rebellious thing to do you probably you know there weren't that many different subcultures out there to align yourself with as there are today so you could be a bogan a skater a surfer play footy play cricket oh, okay I played footy up until under 17 but not a great sportsman played more for friendship um, but the tattoo side of things was just seemed more wild um, and it just drew me into it. A good friend of my dad's was a, a tattoo artist, um, Tattoo Charlie, Charlie Carlson. He'd done time for armor robbery, that sort of thing. Him and my dad were scuba diving um, buddies. So he'd come over and hang out at our house and he was a cool dude, man. He's If I was in my you know early teens, he must have been his early 30s, looked like Rod Stewart, cool dude, you know, had a nice hold of Monaro, like a cool dude. And you're like, wow, I want to maybe be more like him than the local footy coach or something like that. Um, and it just sort of rolled from there. But I also remember my mum saying to me when I was quite young of maybe getting in a little bit of trouble or whatever, her going to me, you can, if you think you can do something and get away with it, that's cool. But also make sure if you get caught, you can handle the consequences. And I pretty much thought that through for the rest of my life. If I'm making decisions, I think, oh, yeah, I can deal with that. When I was a young fella, about 17, um, not far from the studio, um, I went down to the cross with my mates and we'd been drinking. And uh, in those days, it was just a long time ago, this is 50 years ago, there was a tattoo joint there and uh, two or three o'clock in the morning you're drunk and uh, – they were all drunk and uh, we all sort of lined up to get a tat. Um, and there was this sort of like darkness. Was, to me, it was like a dark joint. And uh, the only reason I didn't get a tat is because I was last in line, but I fell asleep. Yeah. And uh, they turfed me out. Yeah. Um, but my mates all got a tat. But it was a sort of like a, it was exciting. But the only thing you do when you're drunk then, those yeah. days. But it was a, but also there was this sort of darkness associated with tattoos and tattoo parlors and that sort yeah. of stuff. Can you explain that to me? Is that something they promoted or is that cultural no, that we th thought about? Or I think I'm probably that desensitised from it because I've been around it for such a long period of time. But I think the general society was you don't want to get a tattoo. Like I got told years ago the police would view someone with a tattoo, one, for stupidity, two, maybe military, three, they're dodgy. You know, So there was always a thing involved where – you were probably on the outskirts of society, you know, maybe slightly dodgy, the criminal underworld, that sort of thing. Then probably maybe the 70s, 80s, the bike, biker gangs came into it. You know, they were pretty high profile, you know, here in Sydney, all that sort of stuff out west. So, you know, guys riding around with mad hairdos and covered in tattoos and baseball bats and shotguns on their, their handlebars. So it was a pretty menacing thing. And then obviously the media gets hold of it. You know, there's some things that happen that are pretty well known and it it just puts the fear into the community. So you wouldn't want your son or your daughter going to get a tattoo because they're then going to be in contact with these people. You're maybe increasing the chances of them being involved in something you didn't bring them up to be involved in. It's interesting. All my sons have got tattoos these yeah. days. Um, and some more now. Than some some of them. It, but it, it, you just said something interesting then, and I do I do recollect this. The whole bikey involvement with um, the tattoo industry. Can you explain that to me? Like how that happened? I'm not from Sydney, so I can't say exactly why. Melbourne the same though? No, Melbourne was always very oh, really? totally different. Melbourne's you know tattoo shops had no association with bike clubs or anything oh, really? like that you know, or even organised crime was generally a different style of crime than, you know, bikey gang stuff. So when I came down to Sydney, it was probably in the midst of, you know, biker wars and tattoo shops getting blown up and shot up, that sort of thing. Um, it was probably territorial. Um, you know, this is my area. And there weren't that many tattoo shops around then. So the tattoo shops that were around were busy. So you did it, you're just protecting your patch. And then from there, it just sort of escalated a lot and it got again in the media and it was so frequent that the government ended up bringing in a licensing system 
to try and weed out organised crime. Ah. So you couldn't be a member of a motorcycle gang. You couldn't have a partner that was. You couldn't have a family member that was. All this sort of stuff to try and clean it up. Why? Why do they try to specifically keep them out of the tattoo joints? I think it just got, it's well documented. It got pretty wild for a period of time. Like I've worked in a shop that was a victim of a firebombing. Um, in Sydney? Yeah, 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 in Sydney in Chippendale. And either a week before or a week after in Ride, there was a guy that was actually shot and killed in a tattoo shop while he's tattooing someone. So it was, it was mental. So, you know, even back then, you if you wanted to open up a business, you had to worry about some people knocking on your door but you probably wouldn't even find a landlord that would lease you a shop because they were too scared that it was going to go go up in flames. That's interesting. Did you travel much? Like, Yeah, t- mate, I left Australia at Boxing Day 1995 and I was away for eight years. You know, I spent five years in London. I lived two years in Amsterdam. You know, I've travelled all through Southeast Asia and I've continued to travel for the rest of my life. Best thing that happened to me was to travel you know, I left Melbourne, this little little bogan, and I went to London. I was like, wow, all of a sudden, you know, I'm working in, in High Street, Kensington, in a market surrounded by super wealthy people, travellers, alternative types. You know, you go into a rave, you know, like the rave scene had kicked off. I was travelling all over Europe. So that was the best thing that happened to me personally, apart from tattooing. It really cracked me open as a human being. But over there, people in England were fascinated by Australia and how it was so controlled. With oh, the tattoo industry? Yes. Oh, yeah. really? But over there, they don't care. No one really cares. So it was a free-for-all. And I, I found when I went and travelled, so back here before I went overseas, no one would really tell you anything because it was pretty competitive. But when I went to the UK... I wasn't a threat to anyone because I knew he can't stay here and open up a shop. So I got a lot of information. That was my kind of university. You worked as a, as a tattoo artist in, yeah, in, in the UK? Yeah, I've tattooed for now 32, 33 years. So the UK, where else did you go? Uh, Amsterdam. I've tattooed in Portugal, in Spain, um, in Thailand. Yeah, a lot of different places. Is there a mecca somewhere in the world that's like is the tattoo mecca? Probably in the 90s, San Francisco was considered the mecca. There's a guy called Ed Hardy that had a shop there and he went there in, in the late 70s. But And he went there specifically because San Francisco, counterculture, free love, all this sort of stuff. So he ended up tattooing a lot of really big Japanese-style work and contemporary art-style work on a lot of members of the gay community and the uh, – the artistic community. So that was a melting pot of tattooing for a long period of time. Like I've spoken to people and they go, San Francisco was the only place in the 80s and 90s where so many people had full sleeve tattoos, dreadlocks, you know, just the alternative lifestyle thing. And that is when tattooing in general started to change. So people were getting in, younger people were getting into it with an artistic background that weren't, you know, from a biker thing or just a knockabout guy and it just sort of worked out. So you got more than just picking your design off the wall. I always associated tattoos with Easy Rider, that type of thing. And when you said San Francisco, I thought, well, maybe that's coming out of there. But you're saying there was a new cohort or a new genre of people yep. in the 90s who sort of brought tattooing alive again. It became more mainstream, like... Guns N' Roses came out, I think, in 1990. So kids were going to see Guns N' Roses whose parents had seen Rose Tattoo. They, Rose Tattoo, inspired Guns N' Roses. You had what they call yuppies, people getting little tribal armbands or an Indian feather and all this sort of stuff. You didn't have to get your traditional tough eagle or skull. You could get a little dream catcher. So the art side had cracked open, so it appealed to a different audience of people. Um and now it's just continued and, and become as mainstream as it's ever been. People are now even going back to the 90s and revisiting those sort of designs and, and building careers off it. Did you have any experience in Japan or was that just a... I've, I've been to Japan probably 15 times. Um, 
from I think 18, I've been fascinated with Japanese tattooing. I bought a book called The Japanese Tattoo. It was a big, large format book. First time I'd ever seen a whole page dedicated to one tattoo, a dragon all the way down the arm. Up until then, you might get picture magazine or some easy rider style biker mag with real small pictures in it of just all shit slammed together, like do-it-yourself sleeve. So I was like, wow, it just had such a, a powerful impact, but not a violent or aggressive one, just wow. And then from there over the years, I'd always wanted to do it, but it took a long time for the general community to catch up. It was a real collector's thing or a tattoo artist thing. But then a TV show called Miami Inc. came along and put it in people's lounge rooms seven days a week, two, three times a day. So all of a sudden, people are becoming intrigued by this show. A guy starts doing a koi fish or a dragon. All of a sudden, this shit's cool. So I want to do that. And that was how I was able to then transition into doing this style full time. I've thought about getting a tattoo. All my sons have got it. I've been thinking about getting a tattoo for a while. And one of the things that I was thinking about getting was uh, my mother, uh, you know, like it would need an artist to do it. In my opinion, anyway, it was a very beautiful woman. And I mean, I have a photograph of her, which I, like I've always thought was a fantastic photo. I still have this photo at my home. She was only young at the time when she had this photograph taken. And the thing that I always remember about my mother is she always wore red lipstick, always. She always had this red lipstick on. In fact, I have a rose that I planted at my farm, which I've sort of named after her. Her name is Marcia. And I've named the rose after her because it remind, the red colour rose reminds me of my mum's lipstick. And, um, and I thought about getting one. I don't know where I would get it, actually, but which part of my body, but but, I, but nonetheless I would get it. I probably wouldn't wear it on display, say, if mm. I got a T-shirt on, but I'd like to have it for myself. Yeah. As a yep. as a memory, um, and it's like having a like having mum's photo on the piano at home, and wearing my mum's photo on my body would be that'd be cool, I think. Yeah. And today acceptable. Um, where I mean, apart from you, do people generally speaking do tattooing for that reason? It is. It's a massive part of it. You've you've got so many different reasons for a tattoo for each different person. First, you've got I want to look cool, I want to look hot, I want to look sexy, I want to try and fit in with a group, I want to do it for me, I want to mark an occasion. There's so many different things. Um, so with what you're talking about is is really common and it would be a process where you would sit down with someone, talk through everything, discuss where you might want to do it, where you don't want to do it, what the possibilities are, talk you through what is going to look good in two and five years' time. Some people, because you have to think of that. Well, how do you mean? I don't understand. Some, some tattoos, like fads of anything, some things can be done and their the execution level is out of this world. But a couple of years in the sun, it's going to look like a pizza. You know, you're not going to know what it is. How, how do you say, mean? Say, for that? example, so say, you know, a nice, tie, a, a nice um, teacup with a nice old rose painted on it and a tea saucer. So someone might want that rose tattooed on them. So traditionally you're deconstructing a normal tattoo. There's no black in it. There's no black outline. So you're going to put that on somebody's body depending on their age, their lifestyle, lifestyle, their skin type, if they're a surfer, if they're in the sun. If you put it in a high exposed area, it's going to look shit because there's no foundation to hold it up. So that's one of the things that I emphasise a lot in the studio is you have to think of the tattoo in 5, 10, 20 years' time and do that for the person, inform them about it. Unfortunately, today there's still plenty of shops and artists that will just do it for the photo for their Instagram or their portfolio. Tattooing is a special thing. There's a connection. It means something to you. So say you go and get that. The person doesn't give you the respect that tattoo deserves, you've got this sentimental tattoo on you. A couple of years' time you look in the mirror and it's horrible. You're going to feel ripped off and you're going to be pissed off and you're going to then probably have a slightly negative look towards tattooing. So nobody's won there except that artist on the day that got some money. And you got It was a transaction yeah. as opposed it's to not, It's not a transaction. It is. It used to be a transaction. It used to be all monetary-based. This is my patch, you can't open up, it's mine. 
You know, you can't control the internet now. There's human interaction. Like what I've worked out over the years is tattoos are, are pretty useless, right? They're to make you feel good about yourself. You know, whether you puff your chest out and think you're a bit tougher or, you know, you turn around, look over your shoulder and think, oh, look a bit hotter or whatever. But there's that's the basic ones and you've got sentimental, you've got marking an occasion, all these other aspects that are equally as important as the artwork. I'm going to come back and yep. talk to you about, I want to talk more specifically about Little Tokyo. I want to talk about the the first episode in the YouTube series and what you've done. And, uh, and you know, I, I wouldn't mind exploring a little bit more about this this point here you're just making just when we do come back um mm. about where would you recommend to say for someone like me i mean what if i just go through the process let's just assume yep. i'm walking in to get a tattoo i want to get a tattoo of my yep. mum. you know what what would you talk to me about but we'll just go we'll go to the break and we'll talk when i come back so i'm back with reese gordon here and we're talking about well his business is called little tokyo it's a tattoo artistry business um, and I, I want to emphasize the artistry part of it, but, but I was talking before the break about, uh, you know, what would happen if I went and got a tattoo. So I'm just interested just to quickly establish what someone like me would do, how would I find you, et cetera, and what would happen once I found you. Two main ways, either, yeah, internet, you'd send an email or you'd have a recommendation and email as well. We would then sit you down with what we would gauge the most suitable artist, the best person for the job. One of your people. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You would come in, you'd have a consultation. Beforehand, we'd ask you to bring in the photo or a series of photos and then we'd sit down and talk to you about, you know, size, placement, you, you want to see it, you don't want to see it. And then talk through all of these options. Um, for example, if it was a black and gray photo with then red lipstick, which means a lot to you, we would probably say maybe no, because maybe no what? Do no I, red lipstick. Right. Uh, and just explain why, but then it's your decision whether you want to go ahead with it. Because it's going to be such a nice soft black and gray photo and then red lips on it. We would say from an artistic point, maybe not. But then say, because it does mean so much to you, we can still do it to the best of our ability. Um, we would probably blow up the photo, stick it on different parts of your body, take some photos of it, and then say, just go away, Mark, and have a think about it. Digest everything you've gone through. We can give you an idea on wait time, on pricing, how long it's going to take, the healing process, and that sort of thing. Um, if everything's cool, we would then look to schedule you in for an appointment. The, the photo, by the way, is black and white. You're right. Yeah. I know you've got a lot of colour on yours. Yeah. Let's stick with you specifically. Yeah. I yeah, would yeah. say your skin tone, Mark, probably no because you have a slight olive complexion and if you're going to go like full colour, again, back to that thing, there's no firm black outline. There's no foundation of the tattoo. Like The Rock is a prime example. The Rock got a massive cover-up on his arm of an old-school tattoo of a bull. No real solid background, no this, that, and the other, and it was all washed out a short time later. He's just had another artist go through it and completely redo the whole thing and give it a lot more structure, a in, lot more depth. Like in black and white? A lot more black into it, yes. Is that because the colours bleed into people with my colour skin? Like, is uh, in general, well, it wouldn't be as vibrant as on, say, someone with pasty skin from the yeah. UK. Right, I got it. Okay. And yeah. that's cool. Really, really yeah. interesting. I might actually, I mean, I don't know. What is it that gets me that, I don't know if it's courage, I, mean, I don't care about the pain thing, but it, it's something you got forever. What is it that would make, in your experience, makes people make the final decision, fuck it, I'm going to do it? Mate, COVID's been a good one. Like it's it's changed people's mindsets. you got to be comfortable with yourself and probably comfortable with your decision-making process and not having external voices in your head. You know, there's so many cases where of over the years where the guy walks into the tattoo shop with his wife, he wants the big dragon, but he leaves with a Pegasus on his arm, <laughs> you know, so all this sort of stuff. Um, so there's that, but COVID's now changed a lot of people's thoughts on a lot of different angles. So now people are probably like, man, the world could have ended. So what am I waiting for? What am I worried about? Fuck you. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah, so totally. I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. And then you know? and fuck it, who cares what anyone thinks? Yeah, yeah. And that comes back to people's personal development of themselves. 
You know, you're you. If someone's going to judge you in today's day and age of a tattoo you've got on your arm, they're a dickhead. I come from an era where the general public viewed me for years with suspicion. Now I'm looked at with intrigue. Yeah, totally. So, and um, what about uh, the neck tattoos and all that stuff? Like, uh, you know, one of my favourite fighters in the world and a lot of people's favourite, Georgia yeah. Cambosis in the other day, and Georgia got him on his neck. And, uh, you know, when I f- first looked at him many, many years ago, when he was, I'm going back eight years, George was a scary-looking dude because he had all these tats and he looked like your typical boxer. But George actually totally the opposite. He's mild-mannered. My life would have gone a completely different way. At 22, I was in the UK and I was booked in to get a big Japanese demon head on my neck. Um, thankfully, the artist got so drunk the night before and hung over, he cancelled my appointment. <laughs> and I see it as a blessing because I would look completely different than I do today. It would have potentially affected my life, how it's gone along. Um, so I'm grateful I did it. But, you know, back to George, apart from being the legend he is, he's a great ambassador for tattooing. You know, he projects it in a positive form where to me, on the other hand, if you've got some big aggressive looking dude dripping with gold chains, he's probably incredibly insecure. Roided up. Yeah, insecure, not comfortable with himself. Yeah. He's not projecting tattooing in a positive light form. He's projecting it the way that majority of society views heavily tattooed people. Do you ever think uh, not having a tattoo would be considered cool? It'll get to that point for sure. Like I don't smoke. My parents smoked maybe because of that reason. Uh, but there's, but now I'm tattooing parents' kids, you know, I'm probably going to end up tattooing grandkids or that sort of thing. But I think there will come a time where it might not be cool. But self-expression and acceptance is at an all-time high and I don't really see it slowing down. So some sections of society might rebel by not having a tattoo where others feel free and confident to be as creative as they want, as they want to be. That's a really good point. Uh, self-expression is at an all-time high. I like yeah. that. And uh, so is acceptance of everyone's yes. self-expression, no matter yep. how it is, whether it's your sexuality or whatever it is. Yep. Um, that's a really good point. And uh, in other words, let me tell you who I am and fuck it if you don't like it. Yeah, that's powerful. Mm. Took me a long time to... I think probably only really in my late 20s, I really became confident with who I am and able to not aggressively go, fuck you, but hey, if you don't like it, that's okay. These days, well, like if you go back 40 years when I was a young fella, if, yeah. if you're a person who didn't conform and toe the line, yep. toe the line exactly the way everybody expected you to, you had, when you got outed, there was consequences associated with that. Mm-hmm. As you said, coppers might look at you funny yep. in business, Business people would look at you funny. You probably wouldn't get employed. Uh, but these days, it's it's no, who cares? Yeah, it's it's cool. That's really cool. Now let's talk about Little Tokyo. By the way, thanks very much for coming on to the Survive and Thrive YouTube series. I mean, it's a, and it's a series about trying to help business people just like you um, work out solutions as to how to get better at what they do. When you came to see me. I suggested that you should hold a hackathon internally with your with your mob, everyone who works for you, yeah. everyone, and maybe a couple of clients even, and uh, hack into your business and the things that your business needs to change or look at or and you to become much more, let's call it inclusive, get a broader, better perspective about how your business rolls. Did you hold one? Not in a group format. I've, I've tried to over the years and always found it incredibly difficult with a lot of creative, and this is not excuses, these are facts. I've because tried, you're a creative. That, that's your primary go-to, yes. right? Yeah, yep. that's how you describe yourself. <clears throat> yeah. Potentially, yes. Well, how would you describe yourself? Um, good question. Um, yeah, a creative person but somebody who's just trying to do the best I can that's finally able to have a shop in my late 30s because up until then there's no way I would have been able to have a shop just because of external forces that I'm not going to sell my soul to. So now I'm trying to make up for lost time, be as creative as I can, you know, yeah, 
bad answer on my behalf, but it's a hard one for me to answer. Well, we, let's dig around a bit. Yeah, um, let's go deep. Let's, um, let's have our own little hackathon. Like, uh, <clears throat> well, well, you are creative. You, sorry, you like to create. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And what does that mean, like to create? Um, it's just like li- every day is an amazing day. Every day I look forward to going work to work, even when, you know, it might be a shitty day or whatever. You're excited to go to work because a lot of creative energy you're around and you feed off it as a artistic person. So I've tried to create an environment for that. But with I've found with artists, you've got extroverted people, you've got introverted people, and obviously everything in between. So I've tried to have hackathons in the past. Nobody will talk. I've even gone to the extremes of making everyone have two shots of tequila to try hmm. and loosen them up and get to talk to me. Take them all out, get everyone drunk in it. Maybe it is me, but I don't know. I don't think I'm an imposing or an intimidating person to talk to. But I spoke to a lot of people individually, like how are you doing, what can I do better, how can I improve your life? And surprisingly, I got a lot of good feedback. Well, not surprisingly. Um, And I found seven artists wanted to cut back from five days a week to four. So I'm like, okay, cool. It's obviously going to hurt the business, but I'm not going to say no because I want to accommodate you to make your life in Little Tokyo as as good as it can be. But say, you know, with that, maybe we need to do a few other little things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, what I did find with the general hackathon was when we spoke about that I need a manager. That was the game changer and the upsetter that sort of pissed some people off. They got upset. With you bringing a manager in, yeah, and you and not and you not being the dude who's micromanaging everyone. Maybe that, like we've already got some managers, but someone that's going to come in and have two managers on a day, but a main one Monday to Friday, and then bring in things that we spoke about about accountability, like you know you need to reply to an email in a certain period of time. You need to do this. You need to do that. You know we were getting emails in once we came back from COVID of like customers that hadn't been rebooked in and they'd been in touch with the artist and, hey, man, we've got four emails from this customer. They've already got a deposit. They want to book in. And then I'd get some attitude like, yeah, I'll book them in when I can. I'm like, ah, okay. And then let it settle, blah, 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 talk the next day. Okay, I'll do it when I'm ready. And I'm like, actually, mate, it doesn't work that way. You know, you might have attained a certain level of success on your own, but you're still in the studio. You can't do that. And it was, it's, it's an, it been an interesting thing. Like in tattoo studios, historically, there's been some sort of hierarchy where artists would consider themselves above a manager, where for me, I've always said we're all on the, the same playing field. But now if somebody's going to come in and start making people accountable, they can't slip through the cracks anymore and me not hear about it. So it's probably confronted a few people about certain things. I actually had some people leave, not specifically because of that, but I think from what they perceive is going to happen. And also people saying to me, people outside tattooing don't get that it's a different business. And I'm like, yes, but it still is. Still is a business. A business. Yes. It has to be run like a business yeah. and it has to have disciplines yes. around it. And I think because tattooing's always been considered what you call a, a cottage industry, no one's really come in with a well-formed business plan. Everyone's just sort of followed on from what the guy they learnt from did and thought that's the way you do it because he was successful. So we're in an age of it expanding and learning but people are still – Maybe people don't have an opportunity to come and talk to somebody like you or may not know someone that owns a business in their circle of friends. So it's kind of hard and and I know a lot of people think that as an artist it's all play and no work but there is actually work involved in it and as it's changing we need to adapt more. Hackathon is easiest if you have everybody in the room together at the same time. Um, but equally, you can hold a hackathon by just yeah. hacking into ev- every one individual. So yeah. you can do it 20 times or yeah. you can do it once with 20 people. It doesn't really matter to me. So you're yeah. saying you did it with once with everybody yeah. individually. 
as yep. opposed to putting them all in the room. And smaller groups, yes. And then I said to you as well, for you to describe the process of what would happen if I came to you yep. and I'd go on the internet and book an appointment or I'd ring up and book an appointment or I'd have a referral, whereas that doesn't happen or hasn't wasn't yep. happening because of people not being accountable, being yeah. not the slack. But And then on top of that, there is an as- association with your artists that I'm an artist and I'm above that yep. shit. Yeah. Um, so that was the issue that you had when you came yep. in for the first episode of Survive and Thrive. And what you've done now is you've – have you implemented some disciplines into the business We're still in the process of interviewing for managers. Like I did what you said and I put it out there on Instagram to our audience. I got two replies Hmm. and I was like, wow. And But it was good as well because I thought if you're not confident to send me a DM of a video talking, how can you talk to my customers, you know, and how can you talk to artists? So but now I think with the great resignation and other things like that, I've actually got some amazing like options that are coming through. So we're interviewing this week. Next week, so I'm, I'm incredibly confident that someone's going to come in from another creative field and people won't feel threatened once the processes are in place. If anything, it is going to make their life easier and they will get rid of any previous, you know, thoughts on how it is going to be or, you know, we don't need a manager or I don't do that sort of stuff and it will run smoother. That'll come down to the personality too, I think. I mean, yeah. And, and- when you choose that individual, will you socialise them amongst your tattoo artists who they're going to manage or are you just going to make the decision yourself and just say, oh, that's one I pick and that's that's going to be the dude? No, no, totally. So when we do the interview, I bring the applicants through the shop, narrow it down. We'll then do a couple of trial days and the artists will know and then we'll get feedback from them. Hey, who, you like this person? Oh, this person was more happy and smiley and interactive this person was actually great but they were a mute so you know and i'm definitely going to get feedback from perfect. from the artists perfect and, and, and i think maybe it's probably a good idea to say to your your you know your tattoo artist because you know, like you've got to have artists because that's how you make your money um look if the dude doesn't work out or the dude that doesn't yeah. work out um we'll move on you yeah because you can put everyone on a trial you yep. can say look you're on a three-month trial that's normal um and uh, if it works, if the individual works out, you can say the trial's over. We're going to want to make it permanent. Or if the trial doesn't work out or you need more time, you just play it out and see how it works. And yeah. uh, then you can make a change. I mean, no one's perfect. And you can't you can't predict a perfect outcome. Yeah. And so that that's good that you're going to do that. And you're going. Yeah. And I, I love the fact you're going to include everybody. Not yeah. everyone. You maybe include a, a representation of everybody yeah. in, in the business. In terms of your process for improving communications between your tattoo artist and how that might affect your brand, do they understand that the Little Tokyo brand may be something that's feeding them, you know, that feeds them business? Do they understand that or do they think it's just them? I think some do, some don't. And then I think it gets to a point where you maybe experience a level of, success and maybe then it starts to slacken off a bit so if somebody is chasing up a booking to get booked in i had to refund that person their deposit it's horrible so that person then's going to go around and bad mouth us it was such a horrible awkward process that they were so excited to come in and get something really cool about themselves you know so that's not good you know so I, I believe the new process will be good and, and it'll be smoother and accountability will be there, not from me personally, because, you know, I got a lot of, you know, so many messages and DMs off people when you go to me in the, in the highlight reel of, of the show, like, what do you want to be, in a, a business or an artist? I'm like, well, I want to be both. And you're like, you can't. And, and I get people going, if anyone, Reese, you can. And I'm like, I can't. Like, you know. I could, but tattooing is the most important thing for me. I love the human interaction side. If anything, I want to mentor younger artists and help them come up and and go further in their career. I'm at my best in the studio, happy, being creative, not like being asked questions that we've run out of stock or or where's this or where's that. That's that being arrogant, that's not my best skill set or my job. 
So, and like you said, I need to make a choice. The most important thing to me is to continue to tattoo and to continue to get better. What would you say today Little Tokyo's brand stands for? And it might seem, obviously going to stand for different things for different people. Mm. Do you think you have an idea about that? Yeah, I'd say progressive. Um, What's that mean? Where progressive in a way of we're not your stereotypical shop. You're modern. modern yeah, modern, um, probably pushing boundaries as well. We've got a extremely diverse client base and artist base. Everybody is welcome. Generally go the extra mile than most maybe do. Which means what? Which means comfort, which means respect, which means information and quality and experience. Okay, so how important do you think it is that Little Tokyo itself lives up to those oh, huge. four or five words? Huge. Like comfort, respect, a good example yep. is respect. I don't come back to you with a, a time and a date or I just yep. ignore your email. Yep. Um, that's disrespectful, I would have thought. For sure. Yeah. Not, it's not just about respecting the artistic part of it. It's mm. about respecting the whole process. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. When you brief in the person you're going to put on the business after your interviews, what sort of things are you going to be looking for? Previously, I've always sort of said you turn up on time, you have your designs ready, you're good to your customers, you pay me on time, all these sort of things. Somehow along the road, they end up getting complicated. So, and the excuses start, which are embarrassing for the person giving you that excuse. So the next level is going to be that as well, but maybe spend a bit more time in the beginning process with them, explaining why all these things are important, not maybe just assuming that they know those answers and, and say like, this business is a culmination of 30 plus years of me tattooing and my life experiences. You know, we've got a large crew of people here. We've got a good history of big name superstar artists, other artists that have come in and built up to be big name artists as well, and other people that are on their way to being those artists. So probably a bit more educational on my behalf to them and what's expected than I've previously done. Can a tattoo artist sort of be like rock star? Yeah, there's that's a common term that a lot of the old timers call the younger people in the industry, you know, rock stars. Really? Yeah. And do you get yeah. rock star clients? I mean, like, have you ever had any? Yeah, really yeah, yeah. Clients? I've tattooed quite a few over the years. I've, Can you throw a few names out? Yeah, I, I tattooed Bieber years ago. Justin I've, Bieber? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tattooed um, Ed Sheeran. Is it because they're, they're touring and they say, I want to get a tattoo in Australia? I think sometimes because I've done quite a few or whatever, maybe you end up on a database or in the music industry, someone knows someone and. It goes from there. With with the Bieber, it was it was a, a cool coincidence. Like his his stylist was a, a cool chick from London. She lands in Sydney on tour, rings her mate up in the UK. Hey, Lel, I want to get tattooed in Sydney, and Lel's like, go see my mate Reese. So there was that connection. She comes walking back into the hotel room. The head of security was a guy Ian that was on the Thrive and Survive, and he's gone. Did you just get tattooed? She's like, yeah. Where from? Oh, in Bondi. I hope Reese did it. Yes. Then Bieber saw it and it just rolled from there. And then he got us back and we tattooed him and all his crew and his dancers. It was, it was a cool thing. That's cool. Did you video it? No, I had to hand my phone in and sign a non-disclosure. Oh, damn. Yeah, it was, it was wild. <laughs> damn. Can you tell us what, what, what tattoos he got? Yeah, I did a big eagle on his arm. Yeah. And, and he was actually pretty cool because generally celebrities have got shit tattoos. Um, unfortunately, they're surrounded by yes people or people that are trying to get a leg up and, and use them or get their mate in, that sort of thing. So he sort of sent me a picture of a big space on his arm and I drew him three eagles, went in there, sat down, looked through his collection, what he's got, and, and he ended up going, man, you just choose which one you think's the best one. I love eagles. When I was a kid at school, um, we had our school, uh, our school was called St. John's Lakemba, and uh, on the front of the football jersey we had an eagle. And I remember, it's funny how you get influenced by people, but one of the teachers there who you know, coached me footy and coached me for years, um, he told me that the reason the school chose the eagle as their emblem is because the eagle flies higher than any other bird. And uh, I've always been fascinated with that whole yep. saying as a kid. 
I reckon Eagle would be a pretty cool tattoo as well. Um, yeah. You know, I'm getting two tattoos so far. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and it's very interesting you bring such a different, to me anyway, uh, such a different perspective on tattoos and tattoo shops. I mean, I have known some, you know, bikies who have owned tattoo shops here in Sydney, particularly there was one in Bondi. Um for a long time um i don't think it exists anymore but and i knew the dude in fact i think uh i might have bought a couple of my son's vouchers to go and get tattoos there jt the, yeah 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 i know jt yeah, well. over the years yeah. um ex bikey guy yeah. um for a whole lot of reasons I, I felt as i had to be, stay away from them joints only because reputationally and you mm. know all that businessy sort of stuff but you sort of bring this uh aura of respectability um well, probably I'll, I'll go one step further. Artistry um, to tattoos, and in those ten years ago, I would no one really. Got, well, I don't know, but people weren't getting photographs of their mum on there. Um, it was more like scary shit on there, you know, like uh, you know, not scary, but, you know, like full yeah. on stuff. And uh, that whole artistry process and the education that you bring to the marketplace and all your artists are now bringing to the marketplace is sort of really for me that's really cool and i love that what you said before this process of being able to express yourself something that's important to you yeah whether it's about yourself or about yeah. some one or an event that was important to you you've made me think a lot about uh and maybe that's part of your your purpose in life is to make people think about yeah. ink and yeah. uh what you put on your body and why you do it and as you said earlier though trying to get them the best possible outcome Based on your experience, yeah, that's yeah, that's a. I reckon that's a fucking great purpose in life, yeah. um, especially when you're an artist. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's it's given me an amazing life. Um, if I was to die tomorrow, and I could look down or look up at myself, I'd be pretty happy with what I've done. Um, but with that, it's like if somebody doesn't like tattoos, but they can look at it and appreciate it and go, "Wow, that's." That's cool. That's an amazing thing as well. The other thing about getting a tattoo, there's no rush. No. I mean, no. assuming I'm going to live for a bit longer, but I, there's, there's no rush. I don't, and even if I'm not going to live longer, it doesn't matter because then I'm fucked up and dead <laughs> anyway. I mean, so it won't make any difference. They'd be burning me. So the tattoo won't make any difference. So yeah, I get it. I mean, I actually, I mean, I'm not only am I totally intrigued by what you do in your industry, um, I'm totally impressed. Yeah, thank you. I really, I'm just loving it. I'm loving the conversation. It's yeah. so cool. Yeah. I'm really glad you came on our YouTube series, Survive and Thrive. Yeah. Um, I hope it helped you. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be totally keen to know what happens yeah. after you've completed your interviewing process and yeah. how it all worked out. But Reese Gordon from Little Tokyo, and I'm going to say one of Sydney's leading tattoo <laughs> parlors, tattoo artists, tattoo organizations, tattoo shop. Yeah. Thanks very much, mate. No, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much.